There's no problem too big or small, no issue too hot or cold, and no subject these gentlemen won't talk about. Let's head into the lab to see what they're working to figure out today. Let's get into it and get down to it. Welcome to Figure It Out. This is George Grumbacher. Joining me as always is Centauri Minor. Hello, folks. Helping us move from awareness to action today is Melissa Brandel. Hello. From August United and Gabe Ramirez of Sightwire. How's it going, you guys? Welcome. Thank you guys for being here. Centauri. This should be good. It's always good. You, who would you most likely buy from? Would it be Ivanka oh. Trump, Billy Mays, or George Foreman? Oh, I guess it's the print. That's a really good question. Depends Thank on you. the product. Yes, yes. Kudos on your question. Um, ooh, uh, cleaning products. Well, Billy Mays. Um, mm-hmm. I really, I, I think all of those people. I think all of those people could sell me on something. Um, but probably George Foreman. He just seems like a trustworthy person, so he could probably sell me anything. Fair enough. So well, we are here talking about influencer marketing, and I don't think that my question was necessarily applicable to that, but. Uh, it seems like the world of advertising has certainly changed, and I don't know remember the last time I saw a TV commercial, but tell us a little bit about what influencer marketing is. Yeah, totally. So influencer marketing is a relatively new form of marketing that's really come up within the past couple of years, and it's very different because it's it's a very authentic form of, of marketing. And so what it the gist of it is that Brands work with people on Instagram, YouTube, blogs, Facebook, um, any sort of social platform who, um, these people who have large followings and they work with these influencers to promote their brands, their their product, their goods, their services um, in a very authentic way to their audiences. Um, now the reason that someone want, would want to work with an influencer is because these influencers have uh, developed these really strong fan bases, these really strong communities, and it's essentially like an influencer is talking to a friend. So, you know, when a friend tells you about a product that they love, of course you're going to trust because there's that trust form between um, you and your friends. So um, that's why when influencers talk about products that they like using, their fans are like, all right, this, you know, this person really likes it, so that means it, it must be good. Um, so that's really where influencer marketing has its strength in, in the marketing world is that it's a really great way for brands to be to become a genuine part of the conversation and to develop that trust with um, their consumer base. So how is an influencer different than a celebrity? Yeah, so um, it's funny that you asked that uh, because a few years ago, I would say that influencers are strictly on social media and um, that's kind of where their influencer stop or influence stops. But now um, influencer marketing has changed so much just within the past couple of months and um, influencers now are you know, getting TV shows, they're now on movies, they now have their own podcasts, they're doing a lot more things and so I would say the line between influencer and celebrity is definitely um, becoming a lot more blurry. I think it's interesting, you know, you mentioned George Foreman could be considered an influencer in his own right, right? You said he's trustworthy. and. You look at you look at him, and when he was selling the former grill, you're like, man, I bet you that guy knows how to cook, right? He'd cook up some chicken, and you know, sure enough, he puts together an infomercial, and and he had a built-in following of folks that trusted him, and and very similar in that vein is that uh, you have trust in these folks, um, especially celebrities, and a lot of a lot of marketers put a lot of um, equity into their celebrity relationships. You know, I think where the shift is is a way where you don't necessarily have to be a George Foreman. You could be an individual that now has as many followers as, say, George Foreman, and, and you're just kind of this regular Joe and documenting your life and creating content that people find compelling and interesting. So that's, I think that's kind of the interesting shift. It's really, you know, the, the, the ability for you to reach people or the barrier to entry before was I got to create this and produce this commercial. It's got to run on all this media. Television stations have to pick it up, and that's, that's, that was the effective channel. Now you have the ability to grow your own audience yourself, distribute it yourself, very similar to your podcast, and then leverage those folks um, towards you know the things that you're naturally passionate about. And sometimes, which we'll explain, we'll probably get into, sometimes that's product and sometimes that's services that you enjoy and you like to use and recommend to people um, that follow you. Is there, a, is there a patient zero? Is there a way to track back to who you guys think might be the first mm. influencer marketer? I would say if I had to 
put a name to that, I would probably say Casey Neistat was really the person who launched the word influencer or even vlogger is probably a better word to describe into what it is today. So Casey Neistat, um, if you're not familiar with him, he uh, is a YouTuber and he was really the first one that started doing daily vlogs. So every single day he would produce a video onto his YouTube channel that was basically a, a video blog of what his day is. So it's just a, his normal day in New York City, uh, he posted online, people loved it. Um, and kind of vlogging from there really, really took off. And um, because of that, we've seen a new wave of these vloggers um, or these new types of influencers now coming into the picture. So he's an interesting example where he, he was approached by Nike and they said, hey, we want you to make a video highlighting our stuff, you know, shoes. And he, took, he tells a story where he took the Nike budget and he was working with the ad executives at the time and, and their agency and totally went off the grid, like <laughs> took all the money. He, he decided he wanted to go take the entire budget and visit as many countries as he could within 10 days and then just film stuff on the fly, highlighting Nike product. Huh. And, and he, the story is really interesting because, you know, they gave him a pretty substantial sum of money and they were obviously concerned when he just flew off the map and he, <laughs> he wasn't getting later. back to right. them. <laughs> but the ultimate result was he pre he produced um, something that's now received, I think, I don't know, 10 million plus views of that, mm -hmm. of that Nike piece that he did and highlights all the countries that he went to and kind of, you know, did his own treatment. He, he made this very authentic piece of content that is now one of the most popular pieces of content that Nike's ever created. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it was with a natural amount of... Uh, like apprehension from the Nike executives and from their agency because it was untraditional in the way that it was created. Nice. So, so maybe you guys can talk a little bit about the evolution of this so that to the point that it's become so um, prolific and so pervasive that there needs to be an agency devoted to influencer marketing. So talk about where was the tipping point of someone saying, hey, we got to get something, some structure behind this. Yeah, so I would say um, influencer marketing really started within social media agencies. And so once the rise of influencers came to be, uh, social media agencies were really the ones that mm. started working directly with these influencers because it was just a natural fit. They were on social media. These agencies were doing social media, producing content for social media. So it was a natural way for them to start working in this space. And then as influencer marketing strategies started to become more and more complex, um, the social media agencies kind of uh, broke off. So that's what happened with our agency where August United, which now focuses only on influencer, actually broke off from another social media agency, Sitewire. Um, and just because there's a lot of complexities now that go into influencer marketing and it's becoming much more of a... Um, a kind of partnership where there are lots of agreements involved, lots of different conversations are happening. So it's not something that a brand should take very lightly. It, it shouldn't be um, kind of something that they do on the side. It really should be a core strategy that they put a lot of, of effort and focus into. Yeah, there's been, and you know, there's been some, um, some compliance issues. So the FTC mm. is beginning to regulate. So, you know, the FTC requires disclosure um, like say in a newspaper, so if you ever open a newspaper up and you read, uh, there's something that may look like an article, but it's not, it's in like mm. a, the advertorial is what they used to right. call them, right? And it had to be disclosed in a particular way because the Federal Trade Commission, one of their jobs is to make sure that there's transparency in advertising and there isn't any, you know, like tomfoolery going on in yeah. terms of people tricking you into thinking something is legitimate news as opposed to like an ad. And so, you know, and this being such a new space, um, there are beginning to be compliance issues where there's been some lawsuits filed with brands that haven't disclosed this is this was a paid you know we paid this influencer to create this piece of content and distribute it out and so you know our recommendation to brands is that if they're looking or thinking about going down this path to make sure that you know you have all of your uh, I's dotted and T's crossed because there are compliance regulations that we have to adhere to uh, and you were seeing more and more of that as this becomes more popular within brands and folks using influencers as a channel to reach people. Mm. And another point to that is that with influencer marketing, you're dealing with people. These influencers are, are real people. And when you're running a campaign that has uh, maybe 30 influencers involved, those are a lot of relationships 
to keep up. And so there's just a lot of time and effort that goes into managing those relationships with the influencers and making sure that, you know, you're not using them just, you know, just for one campaign, but they're actually really building and fostering that relationship into something that's more long term. What are some major brands or maybe campaigns that we may have seen that are that involve influencers? Yeah, I would say um, the there ha- there was a really really good campaign done by Tide on YouTube. So what Tide did was they worked with um, a grouping of very uh, top tier YouTubers. So YouTubers that maybe would have over a million subs. Um, they worked with a group of I would say like six or seven of them and. Um, gave them a, a Tide Pot challenge. So they basically challenged these YouTubers to go out and make something that was super, super messy and then um, create a really fun video around that. Um, and it was cool what they did was because then once someone would create the video, then they would then challenge the next YouTuber, the next YouTuber to um, make their own mess. So each of the videos were connected in some way. So it made someone want to you know, watch the next video and then the next one to see what the next month was. was. So it's like an interesting one. So we work with PetSmart and some of the biggest influencers aren't even human. They're actually (laughs) animals. So if you go on to Instagram, some of the largest Instagram followers are dogs. Really? I I didn't know that. Gotta love, I mean, puppies are cute, right? You want to see them. People Mm -hmm. like to dress up their puppies or or other dogs. And so with with PetSmart, uh, we partnered with them and uh, they they um, sponsored The Secret Life of Pets, which was a movie that came out earlier. Well, it's probably about a year ago now. And uh, what campaign that they ran is they did a green carpet campaign where they got all these influencer do- influential dogs to come in and screen the movie. So lining up. <laughs> 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 and so that, we actually helped to rent out a movie theater in New York and they had dogs in there, you know, like with millions of followers and their owners where, you know, the dogs are more followed than their owners they're like the most influential people uh you can imagine it's crazy and they're not even human um and you know and so really you know using those dogs in in a way and and highlighting them and you know having pet smart um really cater to that to those folks that follow those those animals and as a way to put you know the things that they're doing are cool things that they're doing in front of that audience and so i think that was that was kind of a fun one and, and, um, and mm-hmm. you know you, all the fun stuff that comes around with animals too like yeah. you know like they're they're peeing everywhere <laughs> and doing what they do barking at each other barking at each other and and um so that was really fun but you know that's those are some of the i think that's kind of a more uh non-traditional influencer marketing but really really fun you know it's like it's something you don't even think about that oh my gosh this dog has two million followers on instagram that's incredible yeah is there a way to follow the money that says that hmm. you because you've, you've mentioned some very very large companies some very well-known companies and i guess there's a lot of questions but are all companies doing this are they all embracing it and can you trace um gm used to spend 50 billion dollars on print ads but now they're spending it on this kind of medium yeah so i don't know what the exact number is in the industry right now but we are seeing a lot more brands starting to realize the power of influencer marketing um and so um yeah a lot more brands are starting to to see the value behind it and i think that's only going to continue to grow as as um i would say it's going to take a similar path that social media took in general how a lot of brands were hesitant at first to go on facebook you know why should i make an instagram page and now it's a no-brainer that a brand should have an instagram page and i think soon influencer marketing will will become like that um, and something that we typically track with an influencer campaign is uh, CPM, CPE, CPVs. Um, so a lot of traditional things that are, are usually looked at with a social media campaign. Um, but the extra value that influencer marketing brings is uh, the added value of having that built-in audience. And so you're automatically reaching a larger audience than you would be able to on a normal brand page, um, as well as the creation of content. So uh, when uh, if these influencers are compensated, they're also producing you know the content. They're not just providing the the value of the community. It's also the the content. This they provide they prom, um, create this stellar content that the brand is a lot of times unable to repurpose onto their own social accounts. 
I think that's a great question. So, you know, as agencies, we'll use measurement tools like Nielsen or look at something like Kantar, and we'll try to look at a brand and see, you know, where is the brand spending the bulk of its money? And those types of services typically break out, you know, television span and radio span, and even within digital, they'll break out display and say search engine advertising and things of that nature. And I think that it's so new that there isn't necessarily, they're not catalog, they're not catalog, they're not categorizing things as influencer marketing as a channel, but I have to guess that they'll, you know, they probably will start to because it's, it's really beginning to pick up momentum. Um, but I do think that's an interesting question. Do you feel like, um, not feel like, but do you know of any um, metrics or just kind of impact on influencer market influencers on the brand? So can Tide say that because of that campaign, they sold a million more Tide Pods or whatever that looks like? Yeah, yeah, that's possible. And it's all really what goes into the campaign from, from the start, from the back end. And so let's say if there was a landing page that was created specifically for this YouTube campaign, hmm. then they could track that either through Google Analytics or through a Bitly to see how many uh, clicks that a YouTuber drove to that landing page. And then from there, they can then see the activity that was that was on that page. Or um, they could provide the influencer with the code and then see how many times that code was used to make a purchase of a product. Yeah, those are certainly very direct ways to, to measure whether it's being impactful or not. Just in the brief amount of research that I did, pretty much everybody agrees that this is something they have to move towards, but kind of tough to quantify the actual ROI mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah, yeah, and that, that is something that we, we do realize. and. Right now, influencer marketing is generally more of an awareness tactic, and so you know it gets your brand name out there, gets the your your product uh, packaging out there in front of the audience, so your audience starts recognizing that. Um, but there are ways that um, this is where we see the industry really shifting now in the past couple of months, where there are going to be more ways where you can really track to see beyond just that landing page, beyond just that coupon code, what attribution you can bring, um, you can give to influencer marketing. And that's also being explored right now, but um, traditionally it has been an awareness tactic, but we're moving now more towards the more nitty gritty stuff. So what exactly, walk me through, what would your pitch be? So a brand comes to you and says, hey, we wanna do traditional TV, print, radio, and then one of you steps in and say, hey, have you thought about using influencer marketing? And they say, all right, what is that? What do you say? Like, why that over TV or print? Yeah, so we would ask them, well, first of all, it depends what their, uh, what their target market is. If their target market uh, are millennials or are people under the age of you know, 20, then we would ask them, you know, do you have kids? If they say yes, then we would ask them, what, where do they spend most of, of their time? They say, like, on their phone, on YouTube, and they're like, there. It's, just, it's very, very clear that this younger generation, the millennial generation, they spend so much of their time now on social media. That's where their eyeballs are at. They're not watching TV anymore. I mean, you said that you, didn't, you haven't watched a commercial in who knows how long. So that's just where the attention is nowadays. And so brands need to realize that and, and shift towards uh, moving their messaging and moving their presence to where the, the people are right now. That's interesting. You can look at you know some of the YouTube stars like Bethany Moda and you look at traditional, like let's take um, something like Game of Thrones. So Game of Thrones, the premiere, anyone watch the premiere? I did not. I've I, I heard it was like the oh, biggest really, premiere they've had. We're the only people that did that. Yeah. No, I didn't either. I won't ruin it for you. I'm kind of a Game of Thrones fan. It was fantastic. Winter is coming, if you didn't know. Uh, anyhow, that's a Game of Thrones. So I knew that. Inside reference. Um, you know, I think they got about 16 million. Uh, the viewership was about 16 million, which is, it broke every almost every record in HBO's history nice. in terms of a premiere and the amount of viewers that they drew in. 16 million in the influencer world is not a staggering number. I mean, you have, I mean, it's a pretty impressive number, right? Mm -hmm. Like to say you got 16 million views on a video, but you know, like I think Bethany Moda has a video where she just literally takes her iPhone and goes and gives a tour of her bedroom. This is my bed. This is my closet. This is where I sleep. And you know, to give the people a sense of where she grows up, I think that individual video has more than 15 million views to put it in perspective. So someone with their own video camera on their iPhone taking a shot of their room is garnering as many eyeballs as Game of Thrones premiere, which has the weight of HBO behind it to promote it and a production budget of you know tens of millions of dollars for that in individual episode. And so you know I think what you're seeing is this massive shift from 
uh, in terms of viewers and eyeballs from traditional TV and cable into platforms like YouTube and Instagram. And, and so, you know, the pitch that we, we like to give is, uh, have you ever been to like uh, the Coliseum or um, the, the stadium at Michigan, the big house, you know, where you have 100,000 people? Well, imagine if every one of those 100,000 people was, was your brand's fan and essentially that's the type of weight that an influencer carries. There's sometimes millions of fans that you know follow them every day, are invested in their life and what they do. And so, you know, you essentially get to you you get a piggyback on the equity of that influencer and they get to create unique and compelling content for you, as well as have a distribution mechanism to get that content out to people that actually want to see what, what they're posting about, as opposed to traditional media. Where you know, you just mentioned, I don't watch TV ads. I'm an ad blocker on my phone. Mm-hmm. I don't want to. It's a crapshoot. Have you ever read like an article and the display ad comes and pops in front of you, mm-hmm. and you have to swipe up to get rid of the display ad? A lot of times, I just hit the back button. I don't want to. I don't want to deal with that. Yeah, like with influencer content, like this is content that people are wanting to see, and so when a brand integrates their messaging into it, it becomes content that the fan wants to see and. And it's, it's non-interruptive, uh, and like we were saying earlier, where these fans trust what the influencer's opinions are. And so when an influencer talks highly about a brand, um, then they're, they're going to trust them. And, and rather than a, a commercial where it's easy to, yeah, just, just swipe it away or to turn it off, mm-hmm. this is something that, that people are really wanting to see. So on the flip side of that, walk me through. I'm an influencer. Uh, I really like Jenna Marbles. Is she still popular? Yeah, she okay, is. Good. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. She is. I remember her videos from, uh, from years ago. But no so idea. she's the OG. She's awesome. She's the OG. Yeah. I, if she, if you're Jenna Marbles, you get you realize you're getting a little notoriety. How do you, do you all also broker who she chooses or who where she's going or how does she get involved with the brand? Except uh, on the other side of that. Yeah. So it could happen really in, in two ways. One is where the brand directly reaches out to her and says, Hey Jenna, we have this awesome idea. We think that this brand would really, really fit with, with what you talk about. Let's make a video together. Um, the other way could be where Jenna or um, Jenna also, since she's huge, she has a, a team that she works with. Hmm. Um, her and her team could go to a brand and say, Hey, like Jenna loves this brand. She would love to do something to help you guys out. Let's let's work out something together. And then from there, it's really all about the collaboration. Um, collaboration is key in any sort of influencer partnership. An influencer never wants to be told what to do. Um, they want to be, you know, they they know their audience the best, and so they want to create content that they know that their audience will love. But there's, there's an inherent risk risk there. You know, going back to the Casey Neistat and Nike example is that, you know, brands traditionally have really wanted to control the content of that they put out there, right? Very guarded. Like, I want it. I have this brand style guide. I need it to, you know, these are the words I want people to say to reinforce these points of, you know, the attributes of our product. And so, you know, the key to good influencer marketing is that, you know, you have to, you have to really think about the influencer that you're choosing to partner with and that that person naturally aligns up with your brand because ultimately they have the creative control and that's what makes the content so interesting, right? The boring marketing or stuff that no one wants to pay attention to is the stuff that comes straight from a round table of executives at a brand and says, this is what's gonna be cool, this is what people are gonna like and they they decide that for you and put it together and say, Melissa, you're gonna love this commercial I just created because we think you're gonna love it. The flip side, so this essentially flips it on its head you already like this guy, you follow them on, on Instagram or on YouTube or wherever you may, and you're naturally going to consume their content. But with that comes a bit of risk because you don't have the amount of control that you would have if you were producing that spot or you were producing that piece of content yourself. So I, I do think that you know you have to really think through the folks that you want to partner with. It's not kind of a willy-nilly deal because you're, you're essentially tying yourself to the hip to them. So is someone like a, um, which one is she? Kendall Jenner, is she a celebrity or an influencer? Or she would, both? She, I would say she's a celebrity because she kind of started out on the more traditional celebrity route. Um, I would categorize an influencer as someone who who got their quote unquote fame from from being on social media. Organically. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So it's a YouTuber or a blogger, mm-hmm. somebody like that. Santara, you could be an influencer. Yay! Like, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I feel like it's a scale issue, and Centauri <laughs> currently is certainly an influencer. He's just not to the level of a Justin Bieber. Or... <laughs> I will be the next 
Kylie Jenner. That's what I just decided. <laughs> okay. He actually wrote that down, everybody. <laughs> but there are both. So like you bring up an interesting point. So scale, scale is all a matter of perspective. So, you know, there are micro influencers. So you don't necessarily have to go after the celebrity or the person with hundreds of thousands of followers. You know, if, if someone's a right fit for your brand and they have hundreds or thousands of followers, there's obviously time and effort to get that person onboarded mm-hmm. and to have them create content for you. But, you know, it's like it's finding those people partnering with people that want to solve the problem that your brand or your product or your service solves and if that's a good fit right and it doesn't necessarily have to be this person of this you know big stature or or has hundreds of thousands of folks could be it could be centauri Mm -hmm. if you were the right fit you know yeah, and that, that brings up a great point about engagement that we haven't really gone into yet, where um, influencers that have a high amount of engagement are so much more valuable than influencers that just have large followings and no engagement. Mm. Engagement is something that we really, really look out for because it's some, it's it's pretty easy to you know buy followers now. We never recommend that to influencers because then it's clear that you bought them because your engagement tanks. Um, so when we recommend a, a micro influencer strategy to brands, uh, we recommend that because just the engagement is so much higher with these people who maybe have like 15, 20,000 followers who absolutely adore them than someone who maybe has a like hundred thousand followers and not as great as engagement. And uh, what's really cool about that is that means basically anyone can become an influencer at this point if you just are sharing you know, your thoughts, ideas, content that are original, unique, that people can connect with, um, then it's easy to to get a, a following and doesn't really matter how big it is, as long as they are genuinely interested in what you're talking about, then you're going to have influence over them. What does Bethany Moda do? What does she talk about? She does makeup, uh, fashion, lifestyle, beauty, t- okay. typical girl stuff. Nice. Um, and Casey, what, what, what was that person's content or how, how did they become... Famous. He does uh, the daily vlogs, so really just um, in the life kind of videos in New York City. Uh, he does a lot of technology. Um, yeah. All right. So some of these folks are just they they became really popular because they're compelling. People enjoyed what they had to say. Mm-hmm. So I'm just it's going through my head that people like them because they do view them as totally authentic, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Well, how do you reconcile that now that Casey's a shill for McDonald's or, or, or whatever. Isn't that sort of going contrary to this person's authenticity? I'm not trying to rain on a bridge parade. Just a good I'm, question. I'm curious. No, no yeah, that's a great question. And it really depends on how the influencer handles that. Influencer marketing is at a point now where people understand that for a lot of people, for the Casey Neistat's out there, this is their, their full-time job. And this is how they make money. And right. so uh, I feel like in the very early stages of YouTube, if an influencer would... Uh, would make a sponsored video. Some people would lash out on them and be like, "You're you're a sellout. Like right. you're you're being paid by this brand to talk about this." Um, but now, like people understand that that's that's their full time job, and it really is up to the influencer of of how they handle that relationship, how they handle that openness and honesty with their audience. And they could say something like, "Hey guys, I'm being sponsored by McDonald's, but but the, these are my true thoughts about this, and I'm going to show you why." And then it's the way that they talk about it, the kind of content they produce, is what keeps it authentic. And that's where collaboration really, really comes into play. There is where um, it again, if a brand is telling them what to do, then that's where it becomes inauthentic, and that's why the influencer still wants to have a say so that that they can keep as something that is true to what they would normally produce. You know, and I think it's both sides of the coin where, you know, I was mentioning that it's important that the brands pair up with influencers that are solving the problems that they're passionate about, where it's a, a, a natural kind of extension of their message. And the flip side, shoot for influencers. You know, if you're if you want to stay authentic to your audience, you should probably pair up with brands or services that you genuinely use. Right. I mean, we all we all use brands or services every day, whether it's, you know, your favorite drink at Starbucks or whether it's a pair of running shoes that you find are better than the rest and so you know I think it's important for the influencers to really think through um, is this does this brand or does this service uh, align up with my lifestyle and keeping myself authentic to what I believe uh, and you know you see the same you saw the same problems a lot with um, with, with celebrities right like uh, trying to think what was the uh, the Bill Murray movie where he goes lost in translation, right? So, mm-hmm. right. So that's why they would go and do commercials overseas, and and sponsor brands essentially that didn't want they didn't want to be have a, be associated with them in the U.S. 
knowing they can make a lot of money, so they can go overseas right. and do. Right. But you know, all, all part of that was because they wanted to protect their image of you know brands or services they associated themselves with. I think it's interesting that now I think it's a lot more transparent because now you know you know what the person is consuming or not consuming as a as an influencer. And more and more so, like you mentioned with the the Federal Trade Commission and the compliance behind all this, which my wheels started spinning on that too. It's going to be enormous, right? Um, and difficult, I imagine. I was also reading that uh, that DJ Khaled is the number one Snapchatter. <laughs> yeah. So how do you how do you have compliance on that, right? It's these three minute or how how, how, the, how, how long the like ten second videos. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he has three million viewers or whatever, mm-hmm. and so brands will just hand over their accounts to him, and he'll do whatever he wants, the kind of a thing. So interesting, it's a brave new world for sure. Are there particular industries that are really home runs for this versus mm-hmm. others? Yeah, um, industries that are really great for this are just anything that's product based that can really tend well to a, to a photo or to a video. So typically, like a food brand or clothing, makeup, um, t- technology are are really easy to to showcase how how they work, the benefits of them over a video or a photo. Um, but we're starting to see influencer become more and more prominent and even in nonprofits or in in services, more intangible aspects that are how to do more with a story and a message rather than just mm. plopping it in front of a camera. So have you seen, and I'm sure there's a lot of examples of this, but give us um, an example where it's just gone great, the influencer marketing has worked really well for a brand and in an instance where it didn't quite pan out. Yeah, that's a, a great question. So um, I'll give an example with a campaign that, that we're running right now, actually, with uh, with C's Candies, del- delicious candies. Um, so we're, <laughs> we've been running a couple of campaigns with them, and we just did a, a lollipop day campaign. So lollipop day was um, a couple weekends ago, and we partnered with a grouping of mom influencers um, across Instagram and blogs to share why their family loves these C's lollipops. And then they invited their uh, their fans to enter a giveaway to win a, a year's worth of lollipops. And um, because the moms brought in their children to the photos, um, it just created for some really, really cute content of their kids holding the lollipops, saying funny things. Um, and so just because it was natural for for the families to, and for the kids to enjoy the lollipops, it made a lot of sense. And we saw a lot of traffic being driven to that sweepstakes. Um, an example where influencer marketing didn't work so well would, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of one. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head. I know in general um, where they tend to not work as well as going back to the <clears throat> relinquishing control. You know, it's like mm-hmm. if 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 you try to if you try to put an influencer with too many con- give them too many constraints and not allow them to be you know authentic. That's really the goal here. Is how do you create authentic content? Um, you know those those types of campaigns. Are usually um, you know the audience can smell them out right so they know they consume this guy's content every day or a girl's content every day and and when they looked at something to say is overproduced or doesn't seem to be mm-hmm. you know in line with the type of content they've been creating they don't tend to perform as well yeah I would say we, we had worked with a youtuber where there was just a lot of control from from the brand where um, and it was partly it was partly kind of like um, both sides fault as well where just uh, beforehand um, the criteria of the video wasn't necessarily, necessarily agreed upon and so the YouTuber created the video um, it came back to the brand for first revision and um, there were some things that the, that the YouTuber didn't hit in the video mm. but that wasn't necessarily made very clear beforehand so while the video itself ended out to be a success in terms of views that it got, engagement, um, just the, the process leading up to it was was a struggle because there weren't necessarily the clearest um, uh, just requirements outlined beforehand. And that was a really big learning that we took away with something as complex as a YouTube video where there are a lot of pieces going into it. It's really important to have like a very complete uh, creative brief beforehand that everyone agrees to or to be very clear on the number of revisions that there are going to be. Um, so yeah, communi- I would say like lack of communication or, or misguided requirements is, is what can turn an influencer partnership sour. Is there one medium that's, that's really tops? Is mm-hmm. it Facebook? Is it YouTube? Is it 
Yeah, so it, it really depends. Yes. <laughs> it really depends on the the brand, what the brand is trying to accomplish, um, and where their audience is. And so, if their audience, or I'm sorry, if their target market are um, are younger, let's say like ages 13 to 16, um, maybe Facebook won't be the best uh, approach because they're not on Facebook as much as they are on Instagram or Snapchat or or Musically, which is an app that I, like I don't. <laughs> it's, it's basically like a, a music video app or a, li- a lip singing app um, but all it's the rage of all the kids right now um, but like that would be an ideal platform for someone who's really trying to reach that younger market because that's where they all are right now um, and then yeah it also depends what what their product is like if it's something that um, is I'm trying to think that, that would just cater better to video then then YouTube would work better um, so there's, there's a lot of factors that go into it what was the name of the lip sync app? Musically. Musically. <laughs> You're gonna give it a shot? Well, I think that we need to do a whole episode on figuring out how to use Musically. There's yeah, a just, <laughs> that's just that's and I will do. <laughs> Maybe we should just open it right now, and each one of us should let us take a song. Uh, I think that that's fantastic. What an exciting time, right? <laughs> it's all these new strategies and mm-hmm. uh, never-ending, changing mediums that that, yeah. that that we can use and it's it's still changing every single day i feel like i mean we so i was actually at vidcon a couple of weeks ago which is a, a huge video youtube conference in anaheim that happens once a year and um they bring creators youtubers they bring industry folk together as well as fans and so it's a really interesting conference mm. where the first floor are for the fans Uh, who are wanting to meet their favorite YouTubers and social media stars. So they have a lot of meet and greets going on. The second floor are for the creators. So rising YouTubers, uh, creators who want to learn more about videography and whatnot. And then the third floor are for industry uh, folks. So a lot of really cool panels about the state of the industry. Um, So it's, it's so funny because on the fan floor, it's just... 13 year old girls running around everywhere and and there's like a lot of these musically stars that are now there that are now, <laughs> now i feel like more famous than some of the bigger youtuber stars Amazing. there's a ton of different live streaming apps now that are really popular with this age group uh lively you now um so it's just it's just really funny to see what this younger demographic what kind of platforms are catering to um and we see it to be a lot more of the like kind of like live streaming in the moment stuff um, rather than what we traditionally know to be social media as like Facebook and 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 Twitter. Yeah, so I went to I went to VidCon two years ago, and I've never felt so old in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt it was like this moment is almost like a transitional moment in my life where I realize I'm like officially an old the old guy. Right. And um, it was just I mean it, it the place is surreal. There's tens of thousands of you know, mainly teenage girls that you know are scre- that you know where they are because they scream every time, like literally scream, mm-hmm. like you would see in like nineteen sixties videos of the Beatles, where <laughs> right, like the Beatles would get out of the car and there would be, you know, a bunch of girls there and they'd all faint and scream, like they're fainting and screaming over YouTube stars, and I just, it's it's almost overwhelming, um, just because it, I. You know, I felt old because I am old. I felt old because I felt out of touch with so much of the new technology that was there, you know, and and the stars that were there. And I, I think one of the funniest things about it is that, you know, a lot of the YouTube stars, while, you know, the ones that make a lot of money get the most amount of, of press, the majority of the influencers, you know, they're like living in their parents' basements or, you know, they're not they're not super wealthy people. I mean, yeah, they make they make money on the side and it's great, but you know, they're not never they're, they're not millionaires for the majority right. of them. But they may have millions of fans or subscribers, which is kind of this interesting conundrum. So a lot of them come out in cars, which are like old geo prisms, <laughs> like, right? as opposed to like we're used to seeing, like we're used to seeing, you know, people screaming and fainting over people. They're usually like getting out of a like a Lamborghini or like they're like celebrities, you know, like mm-hmm. with a lot of with a lot of wealth. And so that was that was really interesting to me as well. And then. You know, there's like a live music festival that's part of it now, where mm-hmm. they actually get up and perform. A lot of the YouTube stars are, are more musically inclined. Like I remember I met a guy that had a YouTube channel who just make milkshakes. Like that was the entire <laughs> focus of his channel. He's like, oh, I just make milkshakes. Like, and I remember thinking, like, how many types of milkshakes can you can make? You and it was like, a, 
it was like Forrest Gump, you know. It's like, well, there's, right. you know, there's... <laughs> like if you got to rattle off, you know, the five thousand possible combinations of milkshakes sure, yeah. that you can make. And and that's why I think that influencer marketing can eventually become something that every single brand out there can take totally. advantage of. There are a lot of brands out there that think that they're boring or that they wouldn't have a product that's exciting for camera but really like there are influencers in every in every category there's travel influencers there's tech influencers i mean we we've done a campaign where we worked with welding influencers and and these are people that are just on instagram or twitter that just loved welding and were just talked about it all the time and because of that they developed a following that was also passionate about welding so it's really like any sort of passion you can have you can create a social account around and then yep. people who also love that will want to follow it see i love this because right I, I so my background is a bit more in traditional media and you know you think about how shows were made before and it's a bunch of you know say older guys in a room and nbc figuring out you know the pilots that they're going to pick up you know for their new show or, or say brainstorming around different types of contents of shows that they think would be popular like different types of sitcoms or whatever right so like really the content that we consumed was all within this bubble of folks not very connected with who we are as people well so you know this really flips it where now I can be an influencer you can be an influencer anyone can be an influencer you just have to have a passion around a topic or a subject and now our ability to consume that content is all up to us so we get a vote every day of whether we subscribe to someone or not and the content in which we consume and so I think what what it allows for is you know a, a better representation in terms of the types of content that's out there that the world can consume as opposed to what's just kind of being force fed to us previously, you know, through like television shows or, or things of that nature. So with uh, consumerism and modern culture, do you see um, more traditional agencies being able to pivot or what does that look like? So you're always going to have, well, maybe always have TV and print ads, but are more and more agencies seeing that influencer marketing or even social media is more of a viable strategy or what's going on? I think that you know things like TV and print ads are still going to be around for a long time, but I think we're going to start seeing influencer strategies becoming a part of that, becoming integrated into that. Hmm. Um, so I'll give an example with um, um, Red Nose Day. M&M's did a really big influencer campaign around that, um, but they also had um, different TV shows going on, like telethons, different media campaigns, print ads, um, along with this YouTube partnership with a couple of very large humorous um, YouTubers um, to promote the cause and that was all kind of tied together in a very seamless way so yeah I don't see TV or print or traditional media going away for for quite some time I just see influencer now becoming a more of a part of that to, to support those tr traditional ways so the whole idea of the show is awareness to action. I think that we've covered the awareness piece. So action, if I wanted to become an influencer, how do I do that? And then number two, if I am a company um, thinking about engaging with one, how do I do that? Yeah, so to become an influencer. Make me famous. <laughs> <laughs> so let, like we touched on already, finding a passion that you love talking about and talking about in a unique way. Um, there are definitely a lot of uh, topics that are very saturated now, but if you find a unique way to talk about something, then that's going to catch the, the attention of people. Um, if you're also maybe a first mover on an upcoming platform, that could also launch you into your influencer um, uh, stardom because um, if you're the first one to use a new platform, then people are going to be looking up to you as the example, or you, or you could become a featured creator on that platform. So you have to get into this music. The, yeah, so yeah. Like a 40 year old dude <laughs> doing music like, let's do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really the like the secret sauce to getting started is finding something that you're passionate about, talking about it in a unique way, and then finding a place where it's not done yet. And it can honestly be anything. Like it, I, it could, could be, be anything. like tater tots, so I could turn that into something. You you could have a, a puppet robot and and do like funny funny talk show videos. Yeah, you, it could be you anything. Thought about this. <laughs> my, my, my favorite. We talk. We, my favorite example of this is we. T I mean, let's talk about the bread face vlog. Oh my goodness! Are yeah, you? Uh, so do you, you know about the bread face vlog? Turns no, out I don't. And, and, and I'm sort of sad that it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so the bread face vlog is this uh, female on Instagram, primarily, and she takes different types of bread. 
yeah. like pumpernickel, sure. wheat, Tortilla. rye, <laughs> tortillas, a croissant, maybe a baguette, <laughs> you name it, right? There's an infinite number of pieces of bread that you can get out there. Mm-hmm. Puts it on the table, videotapes herself, smush her face into the bread. Just roll, rolls her face around the bread, and, and, and that's her Instagram account. She makes these you know, 10 second videos of her just rolling her face around. And for some reason, people love it. It's, I mean, it's hilarious. It's something <laughs> unexpected. Like, Does you, she like, say anything? No. no. Well, no. she sometimes she has music playing <laughs> yeah, in the yeah, background to match the mood. There's no reason to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not at all. But yeah, it's just something that's so entertaining, so different, oh and God. people just gravitate towards yeah. it. I hope she's rich and happy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so there are, you know, I think that, you know, if you look at some technical things, um, not to get too deep into it, but you know, there are certain milestones that we know, like we'll take YouTube as an example. Mm. So, you know, say you have a hundred thousand followers, there's a thing called organic reach, meaning, you know, when you post a video, that video will reach X percentage of that hundred thousand as part of their algorithm. Facebook has something similar where organic reach. Um, Facebook organic reach probably has been plummeting, plummeting for brands where it's like less than one percent, I think, is the benchmark now. So it's very hard, even if you have a big community, it's hard for you to to get the, your content in front of that community. Uh, what we do know is, mm. like, say, take YouTube as an example. As you hit certain subscriber counts, your reach will begin to increase. So we, you know, there are certain like milestones within YouTube where, at like, let's say, five thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand, um, they begin to promote you more. Mm. You'll come up more in their searches. And so, you know, if you if you are contemplating becoming um, an influencer, right? The, the first thing, find something passionate. The second thing, you guys are doing it. Create content. Just start creating. Don't overthink mm-hmm. it. Just create content of things that you're passionate about. But the third thing is really beginning to focus on building your subscriber base. So, like, making sure that you're reaching out to folks, trying to get as many people to subscribe to your stuff as possible, because that subscriber count is what really begins to push uh, the YouTube algorithm in general. Uh, to display the videos that you're posting and also posting cadence so Mm -hmm. the more you can post um, typically uh, the more YouTube likes you posting more not less we've even seen where like say you ramped up a schedule of posts and say you're posting say several times a week uh, and you're getting X number of reach on average if you ramp it down to say once every other week you'll see on average you won't reach as many people as your previous posts were so so you want to keep some of those things in mind those are some tips you know, keep an eye on your subscribers, try to increase them, get people to like and subscribe your page, and then try to post on a regular cadence. And um, and those are just some tips to, to help you grow organically your following. And then going along with that, you know, not just keeping an eye out for how it's growing, but interacting yep. with your followers and really, really making it a core part of, of what you do, of talking with the people that are watching with your videos, liking your posts, because that engagement and and I should clarify this earlier, but when we talk about engagement in the influencer marketing world, we're, we're talking about likes, comments, shares, um, views can sometimes be counted towards that. So really interacting with your audience will, will really increase engagement, which is it's a good thing. You want to have that. Um, and then also probably the last thing with that is uh, collaborations. Oh, yeah. So collaborating with other Instagrammers who maybe have a larger following than you do, and then they'll they'll give you a shout out in the in the next post, and then people are gonna go check yourself out. Or collaborating with a larger YouTuber and making a funny video together, where part of that video is posted on his channel, the other part is posted on your channel. So people have to go to both channels to check out the full video. Nice. And from a, a company standpoint, how do I know that I'm ready or how do I engage? It's a big question. Are you talking for like, for you as a person or like for, for this podcast? For, or a, for a brand. For, for a brand. Oh, if they're ready for influencer marketing? Yes. I would say if they're doing a test run always helps. Uh, partnering with a couple of, of very key influencers that they have already developed relationships with um, is a great way to tell how... Uh, audiences like this will respond to a message um, to a certain campaign. So I would say doing a test run with a couple of influencers is a good way, is a good way to get your feet wet. And then from there, if it works out great, um, either deciding to do it in-house or partnering with an agency who can help you scale, um, provide guidance, provide insight into strategies. Um, it's a great way to start just learning more about the industry and what, what you need things can be done. Yeah, a lot of it's relationship-driven where... Uh, you know, we've worked with 
a number of influencers which we know are good fits for certain types of brands. And so us having that relationship sometimes allows us to broker a better deal. Sometimes this allows us to know what the nuances are in <laughs> working with that influencer, uh, like the do's and the don'ts. And, and sometimes an agency can help you just navigate that landscape, deal with contracts, things of that nature, compliance issues. Um, but, you know, I, I think that in terms of know if you're ready or not, the other thing I'd advocate for is, you know, just make sure that, that I, I think we get we get sometimes we get folks to come and may not have a, like any type of presence yet. Like, you know, like say they may just be launching a product and but may not have like a website or have or or may have just a horrendous website or may not have a way to capture that effectively capture that increased demand. Uh, and so, you know, I always like to have them take a step back and say, you know, before you go and do this partnership and raise all this awareness around your product, make sure that you're sending them to a place where you can capitalize on it, where you can either get their information or, you know, they have an opportunity to actually buy the product. Um, we, we get a lot of like early stage folks that may just want to raise awareness but haven't thought through, you know, what's that experience going to be like mm-hmm. if I consume the con- the that content and then want to buy your product but then can't find it or mm-hmm. uh I can't readily purchase it or there's not a place to naturally send me to then you know you, you can squander that opportunity you can squander that that awareness that you've generated nice sweet excellent well where can our listeners find out more information about you melissa yes so for anything influencer related they can check out our website at augustunited.com and also follow me on twitter at at brandel flakes that's like Brand Flakes, but Brand Dole Flakes. Um, and then, Gabe? Yeah, uh, you know, we're also speaking at, we're talking about influencer marketing. We're talking about stopping boring marketing in general. We're on a mission to stop boring marketing. And so uh, the general manager of our influencer agency uh, is speaking at all the digital summit series across the country, most of them. Uh, so we're going to be in Kansas City next week, I think next Wednesday. Uh, at the Digital Summit Kansas City. So anyone in Kansas City, come out to Kansas City and come to our Stop Boring Marketing chat at Digital Summit. Um, come to augustunited.com. Uh, and yeah, that's that's where you can find out the most information about this. Sweet. Awesome. Centauri, what have we forgotten to talk about? Answered all my questions. Thank you guys for being here. I'm Melissa and Gabe. Thank you very much. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the show, leave a review, and tell a friend. And as always, keep questioning because the struggle is real. Great job, guys. Thank you. That was so much fun. 52 minutes.